Sorry, I thought I had a minute. Um, then let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Goedemorgen. So, who has an idea what's laying over there? Don't be shy. Just shout. Yeah, that probably. Yeah, and the other ones? Memory, Memory indeed. Processor, CPU. Yeah. Chips, indeed. That's a good summary. You probably all use them daily, right? In your laptop, in your smartphone, everywhere. I started one half years ago, more or less, at ASMO. And ASMO creates the machines that uh, chip manufacturers use to produce chips. So we sell our machines to companies like Intel, Samsung, TSMC, for example, who makes the chips for Apple. Probably most of you use those. Um, and during the time that I started there, I learned quite a bit on how chips are created. And I realized myself that I found it quite interesting that I never knew much about it. Well, I've been using them for as long as I can remember. So I thought, hey, maybe this is also interesting for other people to know. So that's basically why uh, I created this session. Normally, I, I work as a software architect, and I will explain it a little bit more uh, what I do as well in the later slides. But we'll start with how chips are created. Then we'll look at how we can actually make better chips um, and then see how software is involved in that process. I if you have any questions in between, feel free to interrupt me. So basically, nowadays, a lot of chips are used. Eh? You have a lot of these marketing slides with cars full of chips. Now they estimate everyone has about five computers or connected devices. In a couple of years, they estimate it will be 41. I hope we don't need to carry all of them, because that's a lot. Um, and a lot of data is going around. So, so chips are really important. Um, but first, anyone an idea what this is? I hear a wafer. What's on the wafer? The juke. the juke. Yes. So this is actually a wafer. So this is the basis for chips that are being uh, created, basically. So feel free to have a look and pass them around. Please leave them in the enclosure, because if you put your fingers on them, I will have your fingerprint until eternity. You cannot wipe it off. So you see 564 jukes on this wafer. Feel free to recount it if you don't believe me. Um, that's about the amount of chips that are normally on a wafer, if you have like a CPU. If you have like really small chips like sensors, you can even have thousands of chips on one of these 30 centimeter diameter wafers. And on these wafers to create chips, we use transistors. Uh, so this is a transistor when they were really old and still big so that you could see them. And basically a transistor works like a, a water tap. So water flows in, you can control the amount, and then some water flows out. A transistor works the same, but then instead of for water, it works for electricity. Um, you probably all heard somehow about Moore's law. There are different ways to explain it. Some people say it's simply doubling the amount of transistors every two years. Uh, so here you see that basically going on. So that law is from 1970. We're now in yeah, even beyond 2020. And all those years, the number of transistors doubled every two years. If you think about it, it's insane. Which other industry doubles every two years? If you build houses, do they uh, double in height every two years? If you build cars, will they go twice as fast every two years? I don't think there is an example which grows in the same uh, almost insane amount, but it happens with these uh, transistors. So how small are transistors nowadays? So I put in some examples. Uh, so we talk about nanometers when we talk about transistors, or even smaller than nanometers. Um, so one million nanometers is one millimeter. And here you see some examples of things in nanometers, quite small things. How big do you think a transistor is in nanometers? Seven, five, three, all are more or less correct. I think we're around three nowadays. So uh, it's, it's really small. Uh, we are reaching the point that we're coming towards the atom size uh, with transistors. So it's, it's incredibly small. And why do we want them to be that small? Uh, for example, take a look at this one. This is Lord of the Rings. Some of you might have read it or seen the movie. It's more than 1,100 pages. 
let's say you would print it with a 13 nanometer resolution, which is already quite big, as we just heard we can do it at like 3 nanometers. With 13 nanometers you can print the entire Lord of the Rings on one slice of uh, A4 paper, 2625 times. So that's insane, right? And why would you want that? Uh, that way you need less resources, you need less paper. It's easier to transport. Of course, it's a bit more difficult to read, but there are other solutions for that. If you look at chips, the smaller they become, it's also easier to transport. Uh, the more gigabytes you can put on the same surface, the better it is. Uh, the faster chips become, but also the more energy efficient. If you have smaller transistors, basically chips are more energy efficient. Until, of course, you put more transistors on the same chip, then it again consumes some more power, but uh, it, it's a constant, basically, challenge to create uh, smaller uh, transistors and thereby putting more transistors on a chip. And it all starts with silica sand. So silica sand is the basis to create uh, the wafer that you're holding, and silica sand is actually available in abundance. You can find it almost everywhere. And if at some point at your local golf course you see that they are digging up the white sand, then you need to worry, because then maybe we have run out of silica sand. Uh, actually, the golf courses also have silica sand. There's a lot of it. That silica sand, it's, it's heated to really old temperatures, and then something like this is created out of it. It's called an ingot. So it's a really weird shape. They pull it out of it by circling into the melted uh, silica sand. Um, and from that ingot, wafers are uh, sliced, basically. You slice it like this, and then you have a wafer. And normally, when you work with wafers in a, in a factory, you put a couple of them, 25, in uh, a FOOP, front opening universal pot, and uh, that's then used to go around in the factory. So that's a wafer. Um, if you look at how we deal with wafers, so that wafer is used to create chips on top of it, basically. Uh, one machine can process about 330 wafers per hour. Uh, as we've seen, you can have about 600 chips on one wafer. The number of transistors, for me, it's insane, like 140 million transistors on a square millimeter. You cannot even see it, and uh, it has so many. And each chip is created of multiple layers. So multiple layers are printed on top of it. Depending on the kind of chip, if it's a memory chip or a CPU or whatever, it can be more or less layers, up until about 200 layers that are printed on top of each other. That printing is a little bit like 3D printing. 3D printing, you also put a line, then put a line on top of it, until basically uh, you're done printing. But there is a small change there. Um, when we print it, we print it with uh, quite a, a high level of detail. Uh, if we print two lines on top of each other, um, you can compare that to driving a car for 300 kilometers on a line, driving the exact same line backwards, <coughs> with only two millimeter deviation. That's the accuracy with which we are now printing. <coughs> so here you can see that before we are going to print on it, we will put some resist on the machine, some chemicals. Uh, that's put on the different wafers. <coughs> and then the wafer goes into this machine. This is a lithography machine. And this is basically where the printing happens. Uh, yeah, this is an insanely big machine. You see part of it here. Um, only this machine requires four Boeing 747s to transport and 20 trucks. It's a really large machine, hundreds of thousands of components all involved to uh, print these chips. Some say these machines are more advanced than space shuttles. Yeah, I'm probably biased, so I leave it up to you to decide. And then that wafer is put on a, a so-called wafer table. It's magnetically levitating, which means we use a magnetic field to position the wafer in the right place. We cannot use clamps, because if we clamp it, it would bend. And we need to be really accurate to make sure uh, our chips are working flawlessly. Then uh, the chemicals are on top of this wafer, and then we need to shine some light on this wafer. And uh, nowadays, the newest machines, they use uh, extreme ultraviolet light. So we need to create extreme ultraviolet light and shine it on uh, the chemicals, and uh, I'll show you how that's done.
air uh, are driplets of tin that are ejected with 70 meters per second. They are hit by a laser once, so they are flattened. Then they are hit again, and then they create plasma, which is about the same temperature as the surface of the sun, and that plasma results in extreme ultraviolet light. That process of hitting twice and, and creating the EUV light is done uh, 50,000 times per second without tin splashing around in the machine. Special gases are used to uh, make sure the temperature stays down because of the enormous heat that's being generated. Um, and that way, extreme ultraviolet light is generated. Uh, and it sounds easy when I tell it like that, probably. Um, but only the laser, it has 450,000 components. It's a 40 kilowatt laser. Uh, if you Google it, the lasers used to shoot planes out of the sky are just a little bit stronger. Um, and what you saw before, the machine, is, it's a large machine. It doesn't even include the laser. The laser is in the basement. So it's, it's a huge uh, device. And when you look at it, it looks like this. So this is not a UFO. It's a driplet of tin being hit uh, twice in like uh, a real video. So the temperature is really hot. It's like uh, the surface of the, uh, of the sun to, uh, yeah, to work with. It's only for a fraction of a second, of course. Um, and then that light, it goes through the machine and it needs to be directed by mirrors. Those mirrors need to be extremely flat, because if they are not flat, the EUV light disappears. EUV light is extremely volatile, it, it quickly goes away. These mirrors have more than 100 layers, and if you would stretch them out to the surface of Germany, the highest bump will be less than one millimeter. So they're really smooth. And then you can see how it goes. So here we, uh, there we have the laser. The laser is shooting. We have different mirrors. And then in the end here, we see something which you will see in a second. That's the reticle. It's moving up and down. And then here, it's hitting the wafer and the resist on the wafer. Uh, the reticle which you see at the top, it's a bit like a, um, a template. Probably you've used these in the past, right? When you were a kid, or maybe still. Um, you can write only in the open points. With EUV light, it's basically the same. Only the points that are open, the light can shine through. So that part of the wafer is basically uh, printed. And they look like this. It's a bit more expensive than your normal template. One of these costs about 250,000 euros. And then the interesting thing is, so to print it on, uh, so one reticle is basically for like one layer of a chip, but it needs to be printed about 600 times on the wafer. So you have the reticle stage on the top, the wafer stage at the bottom, and they move basically in the opposite direction. So they move like this, and then really, really fast, like 15 Gs and then continuously, of course, making sure that they are positioned uh, correctly. So that looks like this. And then here you see the end result. So on the right, the laser is basically printing the EUV light. And on the left, you see the next wafer is already being positioned in the correct place. Because it takes some time to position it in the correct place. Later, it's still adjusted every time. Uh, but it is done in parallel to speed up the process, basically. And then in the end, the machine looks like this. So at the top, you can see the reticle being changed. At the bottom, you can see wafers being changed. Um, and somewhere to the left, there would be a foop with uh, the 25 wafers in it. So one by one, now the layers are printed in this, uh, in this machine. So how does it work then? Um, so this picture shows a little bit how the, the light is actually using the chemicals to produce something. So the substrate is basically the wafer. We have the photoresist on top of it, and then in step two, we see the mask, another name for a reticle. So some parts, the light goes through, and in other parts, the light doesn't go through. And at the bottom, you can then see that we have two options. We can either keep the parts where the light shined on, or we can remove the parts where the light has shined on. And that way, we can create transistors and the connections between those transistors. Uh, this is just one step in the, that part, the exposure step, and before we saw the photoresist coating as well. There are many of these steps involved as well. Uh, so after uh, the light has exposed, the chips need to be baked, uh, stuff needs to be removed, etc. So this whole circle needs to be done for every layer. So if you have 200 layers, this circle is executed 200 times. 
Um, then a bit about the different types of machines that are nowadays available. Basically, the, yeah, the older machine is a deep ultraviolet, TUV, uh, which still uses lenses, and the new is EUV. So what I sh showed you before, that's EUV. We use EUV light. It needs mirrors. We cannot use lenses because that would absorb the EUV light. And the big advantage is with EUVs, you can print smaller details. And um, some things in DUV, you maybe need three or four layers. With EUV, you can print the same feature in one layer. So it's basically a better machine. But you can combine them. So it's possible that uh, for the layers that require it, that need really small details, you can do that with EUV. And then later layers that, for instance, need to do the connections, you can do them with a DUV machine. So you can combine the machines. Most customers, they have a bunch of machines. Um, so it's not that the same ones are used over and over again. And the interesting thing is, uh, I, I found it personally quite a miracle that they can get this to happen just once. But apparently they get machines to do this commercially and do it for many times. And the machines that are being sold in the last 30 years, 95% is still being used. Uh, so for some of you who are maybe not even 30 years old, there are machines older than you that are still used to print these things. Of course, you cannot create the newest, fastest chips with those machines. But you can still use them, for instance, to make sensors or some electronic stuff that you put in your refrigerator. Uh, so they're still really useful. And then, yeah, it basically looks like this. This is a wafer with real chips on top of it, or a couple of wafers, actually. But also, let's look a bit towards the future, because there's a lot of discussion like, hey, OK, Moore's Law, we are nearing the end. We cannot go smaller. What's next? And actually, we are working on new type of machines called high NA. As you see in the timelines, they are approaching quite quickly now. So first tests will be done with this. And it again allows to create smaller details, smaller chips, smaller transistors, uh, and, and become even faster. So how does it work? And basically, what's numerical aperture, or NA? That's basically how much light you can focus. So this is an example of the older machines. If you simply put air between the lens and the photoresist and the wafer, you see that uh, the light is bouncing back and forth. If you put some water in between it, you can better focus the light. So the better you can focus the light, the better your numerical aperture is. So this is already happening in the old machines, but I wanted to show you um, what numerical aperture is. So what's new in the, in the new machines? We use new mirrors. Um, the old mirrors were 123 kilograms per mirror. These ones are more than 1,000 kilograms. And as you can see, they are insanely flat. And then you can get uh, like this. Uh, so on the right, you see the new machine. It's basically printing a lot quicker than the old machine. Uh, so faster means, yeah, more chips, better chips. And this shows how the reticle actually uh, works. So le left is the old one, right is the new one. When I saw this movie for the first time, I thought it was one of those YouTube videos where at the end it would shoot out. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Apparently, some colleagues made this actually work. But the one on the right is moving with 32 Gs back and forth. Uh, so that fast, it's basically printing the chips. So that's uh, coming towards the future. And what's also coming is we have more and more measurements. We already now have a lot of measurements in, in all the machines. So while creating the chips, but also afterwards, we uh, measure if things went wrong or right. And that will go to billions of measurements in the near future uh, for uh, every uh, t uh, 25 wafers. And so this sounds nice, but um, yeah, how do we make sure that we have uh, as many chips per day from one machine and as many functional chips per day per machine? Um, for that, we take all kinds of precautions. For example, the rooms, they are extremely clean where, where these kinds of chips are being produced. Uh, if you look at it, NASA, they're quite dirty. If you compare it with uh, that one, we, we actually, the, the rooms, they, they really have monitors. So you can see as soon as a person walks in, you see the number of particles go up. And there are special ways to make sure the number of particles goes down again. For, you can, for instance, not wear perfume. That's already impacting the machines. Uh, it's that sensitive. 
but still things can go wrong. Uh, let's say we have a layer and we look at it from the side. And my design skills aren't really good, so I simply uh, use blocks. We print a second block on top of it. Uh, you probably already notice it's not nicely aligned. So this is already something that's it's not desired. We want to have it as close as possible. Because else you can have something like this. This is uh, an actual figure of it, where layers are basically falling over because they're printed not correctly aligned on top of each other. You can also completely miss them, or you can short circuit them. So there are all kinds of things that can go wrong. Here you see a lot of these examples. And um, that can, for instance, go wrong because there is a really small dust particle on top of the wafer. Then maybe one or more chips uh, will not be produced in the right way. But let's imagine that that dust particle is on the reticle then that means that every wafer produced by that machine will have issues. So that's an even bigger issue. Um, if a chip is wrong, there, there are some options. Uh, we can try, if the lines don't align perfectly, to make the next layer align a bit better. Um, if it's not possible to correct it, uh, you can still detect it and still st sell the chip. Uh, let's imagine you try to create a 16 gigabyte RAM module you detect there is an issue, a small issue on one part of it, you can sell it as an 8 gigabyte chip. Or if you have a quad-core CPU, you sell it as a dual-core. Uh, so that way, even if we cannot fix it, um, still we can make use of those uh, chips. Um, and we measure a lot. So we measure within a layer, called intra-layer, and we measure in between layers, uh, like the one I showed you where the layers don't align nicely, and we call that overlay. And we have different machines for that. So here again, we work with precisions of about two nanometers. Um, and of course, because it's so small, you cannot put it under a microscope. Uh, so what, for instance, happens, and in, uh, that's shown in the next movie as well, is they use different colors of light, and they measure the diffraction. And based on that, they can see if something is wrong or not. So let's see how that works. So and, and the orange stuff were the foops with the wafers. And here, one wafer is being uh, measured. And you see it uses different colors of light to, to, uh, to do that. And there are some points on the wafer, basically, to uh, um, get the right position and everything to the checkpoints. And that way, we can measure if something is wrong. Uh, so in total, if you look at it, we, we measure an insane amount of stuff. Uh, one machine that delivers 31 terabytes of data per week. And we use that to basically recalibrate the machines continuously, uh, because each machine has about 100,000 uh, parameters which we can configure. Uh, let's imagine that uh, the laser in the beginning, it's still relatively cold. When it heats up, you might have to adjust some things. Maybe you need to adjust the mirror, uh, or you need to cool it more. So every change, if there is an earthquake, for example, the machine needs to be recalibrated, uh, even as that, if that earthquake is a couple of countries away. Uh, so this is really uh, on a lower scale. So here we see an example. This is, uh, they call it a mirror, but actually it's more than 4,000 mirrors, and each one of these can be controlled individually with different parameters. Uh, so depending on what we want, we can uh, change those. So this is one of the examples of things that we can control next to uh, almost everything else in the machine. Um, and then we come to the, the more software side of it. So basically at the top you see all kinds of machines. So we looked at the lithography machine that's basically printing. Um, we also saw some inspection tools like the e-beam and the uh, after edge metrology. So those measure if something went wrong. All that data comes into the platform platform does all kinds of calculations, and then it sends back recipes to recalibrate the machine, basically. While we do some of the test environments in the cloud, uh, the real production stuff is always on-premise. Customers are really scared that their data is uh, in the cloud or somewhere because the competition really wants this, this data um, because they can use it to create better chips themselves. And as ASML, we don't want the algorithms to be exposed, because a lot of the algorithms are either top secret or patented. And we also don't want our competition to use them. So this is basically on servers, on, um, on premise, at our customers. And when I first saw it, I thought, like, oh, OK, there is some server rack somewhere. 
but uh, later I found out that for our platform, uh, it's basically a couple of hundred CPUs and a couple of hundred of gigabytes of memory that's being used to process all the data and uh, make sure that the machines are calibrated correctly. Um, so we have been working on a, on a new platform in the last couple of years, which is now already tested at, uh, at customers. And it basically allows us to analyze the data automatically and see what needs to be corrected for the machine to produce better chips. Um, and, and the interesting thing is, uh, so in the past, we had a lot of different applications that were used by the customers, but also by our customer support that works on site at the customer. And every department created their own application. All of them looked differently, worked differently, and most of them were quite slow. And we had some competition that could create better software. And so then uh, we started creating this platform, which basically makes um, it possible for all those departments to run their software on our platform, as we will see in a second. And for that, we have uh, uh, yeah, an extensible domain. So some stuff, like a lot ID or a wafer ID, almost every of our uh, departments use those things. But there is other stuff that is it, it's basically specific for each department. Some use advanced machine learning things, uh, all kinds of weird data models. So we need to support all those different use cases. So it's a platform, like a train platform. Uh, it can be used for slow trains, for fast trains. Uh, normally those trains, it's more, uh, you often have delays. Our platform hopefully works a bit better. But um, and the platform works on Apache Spark. So with Spark, you have a, a driver which basically distributes the work. And then you can have basically whatever number of worker nodes. So you can have either two or a hundred, and the work is distributed across those worker nodes. So all the calculations and computations are done on the worker nodes, and later they're sent back to the driver once it's done. Uh, so that's the basis of, uh, of our platform. On top of that, we have three kinds of plugins. We have data plugins that are used to ingest the data. So every department can ingest whatever data they have into the platform. Can be pictures, can be movies, can be raw data, can be whatever. Uh, then we have UI plugins, which can be used to customize uh, the UI. Because um, yeah, depending on what data you have, you probably want to visualize it differently. And lastly, we have processing plugins. So if in the UI someone says, OK, for these lots, I want to do this analysis, and I can click Start Analysis, then the processing plugin will be called, uh, and all the steps will be done uh, in that one. So that way, the entire platform is basically extensible. We already have, I think by now, like dozens of plugins, and it will be uh, a lot more. More and more teams are onboarding on this platform now. Um, on a bit broader scope, it basically looks uh, a bit like this. Uh, so towards the front end, we're using uh, Spring with MongoDB, we have a React front-end. Um, we use Neo4j and a lot of different tools. So this is basically, yeah, we can use it either via the front-end, but also via jobs. So for example, after each uh, set of wafers is processed, after a lot is processed, a job can be triggered, which then recalibrates the machine again. Um, so this is, in a nutshell, the different, uh, the most important uh, Java-related tools and libraries that we are using. Uh, so probably a lot of that uh, will sound familiar to you, or you have seen it in the last couple of days here already. And uh, the interesting thing is, while the platform is completely built in Java, plugins can be built in Java, but you can build plugins actually in different languages as well. Uh, so a lot of our departments, they use other languages, like C or Julia or other low-level lang uh, languages. If they want to use the platform and we would only support Java, then they will need to, need to rewrite everything. And that's, of course, not really uh, economically efficient. So we support those languages as well. So how do we do it? <coughs> From a processing plugin, you can actually call logic written in, in different languages. It can be Julia, can be basically any language. Um, and that way, yeah, we support everything that's already there, and the migration from the old solution to the new solution is a lot easier. They can just write the UI plugins for it instead of having to rewrite the entire processing logic. Um, so that's a lot more efficient. And they can use basically anything. So this is an example. Uh, machine learning, nowadays it's cool and hip, so I needed to include it. But we actually use this. <coughs> 
as you see at the top, that's basically um, a scan that's being made. And if we do it at speed, uh, normal speed, we can capture about 70% of the defects. If we slow it down, so we make a slower scan, we can get to 100%. But if we do slower scans, we cannot scan as many wafers. We need to scan less wafers. So then we might miss defects in those wafers. Um, with machine learning, we actually could, with the same speed, capture 92% of the defects. Uh, so it's not 100%, but pretty close. Uh, and, and all of this is basically supported. And for that, we basically we create an, an extensive toolbox um, to get started with plugins, so things like Maven archetypes, documentation, and everything uh, to get this working. Um, in the end, uh, you might think, hey, is this a hobby project of one or two? It's a little bit bigger nowadays. 150 people are working only on the platform, and then dozens more people are working on, on the plugin. So it's a relatively huge uh, platform and, and ecosystem around it. And then you basically get this. This is uh, a screenshot of the application. And to give a bit of context about it, if you look at the top there, you see CE. That basically means correctable errors. And here you see arrows that basically all point in the same direction. Uh, so if each layer is printed a bit too far to the right, uh, to the left for you, then uh, we can, of course, say, OK, the next layer, we all need to adjust it a little bit to the left, because then next time it's better. So that's basically correctable errors. We can correct them. On the left, here you see all kinds of errors and all kinds of color. Different color means uh, that the uh, error is bigger or smaller. I think uh, the more yellowish or reddish, uh, the more the error is. Non-correctable errors basically means one error says, oh, it's too far to that side. The other says it's too far to that side. Yeah, what do you do? Uh, so with some advanced logic and uh, uh, learning a lot, you might uh, be able to extract some correctable errors out of those. But yeah, by default, those are uh, a bit challenging. Uh, so this is one, uh, we call it a wafer plot. We can make all kinds of plots. Uh, so uh, we can compare, for instance, one wafer to another wafer, or we can compare all the wafers from a lot, or we can compare all the wafers from one machine from that day to see where the issue is. Is it an issue on a specific wafer? Is it an issue on the machine, etc. Uh, so uh, to recap, <coughs> uh, well, some of these things, uh, well, at least for me, some of these things seemed quite impossible. Uh, what, what we did, uh, or what my colleagues did in the, in the hardware part, um, it's quite unique. There is also, for the EUV part, there is no competition. Uh, this is the only company that's, that's able to do these kind of things. Um, and they still keep evolving. And I found out that it's largely because of the mindset. Basically, there is a roadmap, like we want to be here in five years. And we don't really care how we get there, as long as we get there. Uh, and of course, there is a large budget for research and everything. Uh, but with that mentality, we, we are able to overcome quite some hurdles. Uh, for example, with Apache Spark, we struggled a bit within our project because we wanted to give the customer feedback how far the processing was. Uh, so a processing plugin can run. It can run for a really long time. But as a customer, uh, you want to know if it's still running but also like, hey, is it on 50% or 80% or whatever? Out of the box, that wasn't possible with Spark. Uh, but by using a lot of low-level Spark APIs, um, we in the end managed to actually track the progress and also map it back to concepts that we use. Because uh, in Spark, you have concepts like a job and things like that, um, and stages and all these lower-level details. Users of our platform, they don't know what a stage is or a job is. They have no clue about Spark. So we somehow needed to relate that progress in Spark concepts back to the concepts that we do, um, and then yeah, give that feedback. And in the end, that, that worked pretty well. Um, so to realize the, the entire uh, platform and the ecosystem, we use a lot of the Java tools that are available. As you've seen, uh, we, we use a lot of stuff. Uh, but what I want to advise you, uh, I often see conferences where they say, oh, this is the magic bullet, all use Spark. Yeah, never do that. Uh, pick the tools that you need for your job and, and start with simple tools. We use Kafka nowadays, but until like half a year ago, we still did REST. 
because it worked until that point of time and it was easier to set up at that point of time. Later we realized, okay, we need more advanced stuff. We want to do messaging, we want to do streaming data. Then we went to Spark and uh, to Kafka, and that's a gradual move. We started with converting some of the REST endpoints to uh, Kafka endpoints whenever we needed it, and that way uh, everything evolved. Um, and sometimes we also involve the tools or the languages which we, which we use. I know for one of the languages, it wasn't running properly on our platform. Uh, so some of our colleagues, they helped actually with the language to improve it, uh, so that I think it was in the threading part, uh, it, it actually worked better. Uh, so if you encounter some issues, uh, reach out to maintainers of these softwares to help them and, and solve it directly, because then it's managed automatically for you. Um, and of course, I mean, we helped in some parts. In other parts, I mean, we're still a company, so some parts are also patented. Uh, and we have some custom solutions made on top of it. But yeah, that way, we basically uh, managed to build the entire platform. With that, are there any questions? If you have questions later, also feel free to uh, reach out. Uh, please shout. <laughs> The question is, did we orient our machines regarding to the magnetic field of the Earth? That's a really good question. I have no clue. I'm more in the software part. Now, and, and nowadays, our company is 40,000 people, large, and I don't think there is one person that knows everything. Uh, uh, so everyone focuses on their field of expertise, but I have no doubt some of our colleagues who are uh, into these physics uh, things had a look at that to see what the best solution is for it. Yeah. So the question is, um, and we have a lot of currently in Taiwan happening in uh, processor production, uh, and now we try to do it in the US and Europe. And why does it take so long? There are a number of reasons. One, uh, FAP as they call it, costs I think between 10 and 20 billion uh, dollars nowadays. So there are not, uh, not many companies who can actually pay it, um, and a lot of it is subsidized nowadays. But even if you can't pay it, um, you need machines from us, for example, but also from other companies. And we now, I think we have a backlog for two years. There's so much demand, and we're the only ones producing those EUV machines. So you need to wait. Um, and maybe even more important is the people operating these machines, they are highly skilled, and they learned it through many years of experience. You cannot easily teach people the same things. Uh, from what I understood is that uh, our colleagues from customer support, they are daily working on machines at our customers, which is quite surprising because our customers are companies like Intel who are in this business for longer than we are, and they know an insanely amount of, of chip manufacturing. Uh, but it's so complicated that you need really specialistic knowledge, and, and that's also what uh, there were some discussions within our company as well. And, and someone there made a good remark. They said, like, yeah, you can try to hire people, but the only place you can hire them from is either from your competition or from your supplier. And either of those, yeah, if you look at the total production of chips, it will impact it again. And so it's a really complex process. It's not like setting up a, a factory and, and you're done. Good, really good question. Why do we make square chips on a round template? Um, they are round because um, the ingot that we saw, it's dripped in uh, melted silica, and then you get a round thingy, basically, and apparently that works better than having a square one. I don't know exactly what the reason for it is. Um, so that's why we use round ones, and I think round ones are also a bit less sensitive, because if you have a square one, you have edges that can break and that are a bit more brittle. Um, so it's a good question, and in the past, they also experimented with, for example, smaller uh, wafer sizes, so it was still a circle, but smaller. Uh, then they went bigger and bigger. Uh, there are even ones that are bigger than the 30-centimeter the disc that is now somewhere, I don't know where. Um, 
but then they found out those are actually more and not efficient from cost perspective to produce and, and create. So they did some research and apparently round was the best solution, but it's a bit weird indeed. Because uh, <laughs> the ones on the edges, you, can, you have to throw them away. It's basically a half chip. Yeah. Yes? Sorry? So the question is, do you have an integration environment? Um, yes, we have uh, a test environments. We, we run some of them in the cloud. Uh, but most of it is with uh, data that we produce ourselves. Because our customer doesn't give us the data. Uh, so while our software is running on machines in the customer side, we are not even allowed to touch them. Uh, we cannot get the data of it. We don't have a connection to it from the outside world. It's really um, secure. Uh, so most of, uh, unless they in the end give permission because they have some issue, we might be able to use real data. But most of the time we have uh, yeah, data that we created ourselves and that we used to do indeed uh, all the testing and uh, to see if the data that comes out uh, in the, the wafer plots that you saw in the dashboard, if they are correct indeed. That's, that's all being tested automatically, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, how do you distribute your software? Um, I'm not completely sure. I never installed the customer site. Uh, but I think we, um, we provide it via server from our site. And I think then we get an exception that, yeah, or, or actually we provide them a manual that they can install it manually, something like that. Uh, but it's really something where they are heavily involved. We cannot uh, do whatever we want on those machines. Uh, even for debugging purposes, uh, we have to create really extensive manuals, like, okay, if this goes wrong, it's probably this, or if not, please supply us like this small information, uh, then maybe we can assist you further, because they, they won't just give us the log files or a data dump or something like that. So that makes it uh, extra complicated, yeah. Uh, so the question is, can you reuse the material from an incorrect wafer, I think? Um, I don't think you can reuse them, because uh, I see a lot of them on eBay. <laughs> if you look on eBay, a lot of, uh, uh, especially in Asia, most of the chips are manufactured, a lot of uh, countries there. Um, if you want, you can buy a wafer for like 50 euros or something, uh, and they ship it to you. I. I I'm not sure if you can reuse them. I, I think it's not efficient, because a wafer is relatively cheap. So to reuse it, you would have to somehow scratch the surface away and then get a new surface on top of it. I think that's probably not cost efficient, but I'm not 100% sure. Yes? Do you have a gigantic AI in your basement doing cheap layouting for you? Uh, if we have a, a gigantic AI doing chip layouting, um, we, we don't do the chip printing. That's, that's basically what our customers do. And they probably also have a lot of AI. We also have a lot of AI to analyze stuff. Um, but it's all within premises. We, we are not allowed to use any AI connected to the internet. Any other questions? Feel free to shout, because I, ah, yeah. Uh, so the question is, how fast can you get a change into production? Um, I would say it depends, <laughs> as usual. Now, yeah, like I mentioned, I mean, uh, if it's really something where we need to change our software for, then basically the customer needs to reinstall it. But you can imagine, uh, um, it's, it's something I never realized. So if, if a customer cannot print chips for like one day, cannot use a machine for one day, the price is really huge. It's like, I don't know, 100,000 euros a day or something, or even millions. But it's not about that one day. They actually, to stop the machine, they need to ramp it down. Uh, so from doing like, I don't know, 1,000 wafers a day, they go to 500 to 250 across multiple days. And then once it's fixed, they need to ramp up again. 
and calibrate it so that it goes again. And so to do one fix actually takes multiple days, but it's, yeah, it's so costly that it doesn't work. Uh, we have customer sites at, at each of and every customer. So it's, yeah, one of the most important things is to keep the machine running, basically. How fast probably depends on the urgency. Any other questions? I don't. Yeah. How many billions uh, cost your your mistake, your programming mistake? <coughs> uh, so the question is, how many billions does your programming mistake cost? Yeah, I'm an architect. I only do PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> no, without kidding. I mean, the software we make, it still uh, it runs on on separate servers. It's relatively easy to update. Um, there is also software like low-level software running on the machines. That one is, is way more critical. So to release that and to change that, there's a really, uh, really tough process to go through because that really needs to be working well. For us, yeah, I mean, every mistake will cost millions in the end. Every hour that the machine isn't running might already cost millions. So yeah, it, it's really vital that it, it works well and we have a lot of processes in place to, to make sure that it works, uh, yeah. See any more hands? And I'll show a last quick video. So th this is a bit of marketing, but it shows how the chips or the wafers go around. So this is how it works in an actual machine. So it's not people walking around with a set of wafers. Uh, let's play it again. Uh, so the wafers go over conveyor belt, sort of, and uh, automatically go to the machine. So you see entire rows of machines. So this is how it looks like in a, in a real factory. Uh, so it's really huge. and uh, they try to contain the wafers and not expose them because even, uh, you saw it's like 10 dust particles per square meter, even that is a bit too much. So they prefer to keep it in enclosures that are even cleaner than that. Um, so that's it for me. So thank you all for joining and if you have any questions later, come here. <laughs>